What's cracking, big dogs? It's Monday morning, which means we are back with another episode of Behind the Business of Fantasy Football. You know, we try to mix these episodes up to a varying degree. Sometimes we bring on content creators. The next few episodes, we're going to try to bring on some people that are a little bit more behind the scenes so we can get a, a good idea of how these operations that you hear about throughout some of the content creation, you know, they're, they're plugged into all the time. You hear the names, you hear the brands, but from my point of view, it's interesting to hear about how those brands were built and the people behind the technology and the software and, and the visions of these bigger brands that you guys hear through us. So today we are bringing on my man, Nick Solsky, president of Monkey Knife Fight, one of our partners, one of many, many partners in the space. You've heard the name about a zillion times up to this point. Nick, without a K, I was, uh, I was fortunate enough to to meet you in Las Vegas for the FSGA last year, which was a which was a really 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 fun night. That uh, that steakhouse that we went to, SDK, to this day is still my favorite margarita of all time. I'm a big margarita guy, and that one was fantastic. So that was a very very memorable dinner for me. As as was the uh, the night and the meeting. It was great to meet you. Obviously, it's cool that we get to link back up, and I'm excited to to have this talk with you. Uh, kind of get into the grit of Monkey Knife Fight, the insane scaling ability that you guys have had over the last year or two years, even in this uh, COVID pandemic, and everything seems to be going really, really, really well for you guys at this time. So I'm excited to bring you on. I'm excited to have this talk. And uh, with that, welcome to the business of fantasy football. It's a pleasure to be here. And it's funny that you brought up our first meeting last year at FSGA, because that day, that was a bonkers day. I mean, that was a good meal. I'm not a margarita guy. I like tequila, but I'm not a big margarita guy. But that day was bonkers because like Monkey Night Fight, we, we launched September of 2018. But, but that FSGA, we won a couple awards. And, you know, I've been around the fantasy industry for a long time. And that was the first, those are the first awards, um, you know, I was ever fortunate enough to be a part of. And it was, it was pretty, it was pretty exciting. And I remember like leaving the conference and walking down the strip. And, and I think you, you had your trusty camera and you took some great <laughs> pictures that we've actually, we actually used, um, you know, in a couple of videos and things like that of the trophies we won. And then we had that great meal. Like, no, you were, I feel like you were kind of right there at, at the beginning of the, of the real explosion, you know, monkey knife fight had, had definitely, you know, we had garnered a bit of a name in the space, but I really do think that that conference really put us front and center with a lot of the, the core industry people. We gained a lot of credibility and I think legitimacy during that FSGA conference. And uh, I mean, and literally you were right there with your camera. So it's, it's great to join you on your on your on your show. And, and I've seen the first couple episodes. And it's an honor to follow the great, you know, the great guys that you've, that you've had on so far. And, and I'm happy to, to dig in. As you know, I'm, I'm no BS. So I'll, I'll tell you the real goods, man. Yeah, that was that was a that was a funny night because I, I remember you know walking down the strip and we were like waiting for the waterfalls to shoot up in front of the Bellagio. We're like, oh, get the picture right now, get the picture right now, and, and they came out pretty crispy. Uh, those awards were were cool. So just kind of remind everybody, or for people that don't know, what what awards did you guys win at the event? So we won Disruptor of the Year, which I was really proud about. I mean, it, it disrupting is everything I've wanted to do my entire career, and then we won Rookie of the Year. And and I will say it was it was kind of funny, you know, when I posted the rookie of the year trophy onto my onto my my social feeds, and you know, I have I have friends who know that I've been in the industry for 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 almost a decade or over a decade. Sorry, so you know, there were a lot of uh, Dennis Quaid Dennis Quaid references that my friends were throwing at me, right? The rook, the oldest yeah, rookie yeah. there has <laughs> ever been, and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, no, those were those were great awards. I mean, it, it's it was. You know, we were nominated with some really great folks, but ultimately, you know, rookie of the year was great. But disruptor of the year, that is where I really like to hang our hat. I mean, that's exactly what we tried to do when we launched Monkey Knife Fight. And that's what we're still trying to do now, even in the next stage of our business, you know, after getting acquired by Bally's a few weeks ago. And now we're really thinking about how to disrupt um, at, at, at an even higher level, right? So it's uh, those, those, those two awards are pretty fun. Yeah, so... I mean, you guys won the Rookie of the Year award, but you're not, you know, you're not at like a rookie level in terms of where you're at in the industry right now. You're the third biggest daily fantasy sports um, gaming platform behind DraftKings and FanDuel, correct? Yeah, that is correct. It's been a pretty, it's been a ridiculous rise. And I mean, the reality is we won Rookie of the Year, you know, it was just over a year ago. And it's been, 2020 was a crazy year. I mean, 2020 was a crazy year for, 
everyone in the sports space because of the pandemic. But for us, it was just meteoric. Yeah, dude, you guys, you guys scaled so quickly. And I do want to get into the, you know, the logistics and the, and the technical side of, of how to scale from a business perspective, because you guys did it so, so quickly and something like that can go so wrong, so fast, you know, just from an outside point of view, but you guys have done it so, so well and so successfully. Before we get into that, though, I do want to kind of pull back the curtain on, I guess, how you got to where you are. I know, uh, I, you know, up, up to these interviews, I try to do a lot of research on the person that I am interviewing so I can get, I can give audience uh, context and things like that. So I, I saw a lot of the interviews that you have done that have been up on YouTube and stuff. So you kind of started in, in media per se, and you had almost been an on-air personality for some of the things you were doing and then eventually started, you know, monkey knife fight. So give us like a quick background of, you know, your, your passion for media, how you got started, what's your deal with fantasy football and like how it all kind of came together to monkey knife fight. Wow. All right. And, and is the connection okay? You, you can hear me all right? We we went out there for like a good 15, 20 seconds, but I think the audio came through. So like we were just like stuck in a real weird face, but like, don't worry about it. People know we're ugly anyways. It's all good, man. Yeah. Tech. It's, it's always tech. So I started off making TV shows and movies. I, I started actually making kids television shows for a period of time. I hosted my own and produced and directed my own kids show up in Canada. And then I started, you know, I started playing fantasy football Man, I'm, I'm, I'm way older than, than you. But I started playing fantasy football back in like 2005, I want to say, 2004. And at that point, I was talking about sports on a Canadian sports talk show. And, and I was a regular guest on their show. You know, it was just a, it was like a, like a best damn sports show in Canada. It was called Off the Record. And they would have like B and C level, you know, t television people on to talk about sports. And I've been, I played sports at a pretty high level. And, and so that gave me a little bit of credibility to to jump on the show. Anyway, what what sports, I, I, what sports did you play? Um, I played rugby. I actually represented I actually represented Canada at the Maccabee Games in 1997. Which, for those non Jewish fans <laughs> of your show, it's the Jewish Olympics that happen in Israel every year. Wow. But uh, but I but I played I played rugby at university. We actually were 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 Atlantic Canadian champions two years three years in a row. So yeah, I mean, I've been, you know, so I obviously I used my playing rugby for Canada as, as an excuse to get the, the sports show people to take me a little bit more credibly. But anyway, like I was just talking about sports, got to know the producer of, of that show called Off the Record. And he also was a pretty big fantasy sports player at that point. That was really before YouTube, you know, that was before podcasts, really. There wasn't a lot of content, digital content out there, you know, whether it broadcast or broadband. So we decided we pitched the the network called TSN up in Canada to do a fantasy sports show. And we ended up doing it, something called the Fantasy Hockey Report. I, I actually was one of the hosts of the show. My co-host is a guy named Scott Cullen, who a lot of your listeners or watchers will probably know. Scott, you know, writes for The Athletic now. Scott's one of the biggest fantasy personalities in, in Canada. Great guy. He write, does a lot of the writing for MKF as well. But yeah, that I mean that that, that got me into really just, you know, thinking about fantasy sports as, as it relates to media. And then I started thinking about, you know, I got obsessed with fantasy sports. I mean, the reality is any good producer wants to produce content that they're passionate about. And, you know, if there's one thing I am, I'm a pretty passionate fellow. So I started thinking about how fantasy sports and media and the experience of watching live sports, how Quite frankly, they're extraordinarily complementary of one another. And at that point, a lot of people were talking about second screen experiences and how people, you know, mobile phones started, you know, you know, iPhones were starting to blow up and technology was improving, lots more apps and smartphones. And so a lot of people were thinking about and talking about that second screen companion to live sports and being a, a passionate fantasy player, knowing that if you have a player in a specific game that you're watching on television, regardless of how boring that game happens to be, or regardless of, of whether it's a blowout or not, if you have a player going uh, on your fantasy team, you're more likely to watch the game longer. I mean, that's just fact. That's, yeah. Um, I mean, no one's watching, no one's watching the fucking Jags Browns on a Thursday night football, except for us fantasy no. players who is, who are starting to make up like a large majority of, of the ratings for those games, probably a hundred percent. And there's no sports betting in North America, right? So fantasy was the only sweat that a sports fan could get while they're watching games. And let's face it, that makes games more fun. So I started thinking about how could fantasy and broadcast be fused together. And I created my first startup. This was back in like 2008 and it was called InGamer. And it was a live fantasy game that you would play in conjunction, like while you're watching 
the, the game. It was a free to play game, licensed it to a bunch of company, or raised a small amount of, of angel funding, built it with a technology co-founder. I'm not a tech guy, I'm a, I'm a talker guy. And ultimately, uh, you know, licensed it to a couple media companies and, uh, and, it, and it was a lot of fun, but it was a free to play game. And ultimately what I realized in that first startup is that the business model of licensing products to media companies, it's really challenging. Unless you have a long runway where you don't have to require media companies to pay you money, it's gonna be a real challenge because all the media companies care about is generating revenue through sponsors, right? And in order for sponsors to really ante up a, a, bunch, of a bunch of money for the broadcasters, you need eyeballs. Well, where do the eyeballs come from if you're a startup, right? So we don't have to jump into that, into that, into that world. But then I, I left that startup and ended up joining another bigger regulated international gaming company. And this was around 2012, 2013. And this was right when FanDuel and DraftKings in the, in the classic, you know, in traditional daily fantasy sports started exploding. And a bunch of gaming people were looking at the North American DFS space knowing that there's no sports gambling, realizing the DFS is as close to sports betting as you can get without it being illegal. And they were th this company was looking at how to take their footprint from a regulated gaming perspective. They, they were a horse race betting technology company that had relationships with the casinos all across the US. So they had relationships with gaming people and they wanted to figure out how to tap into DFS. Anyway, I joined that company and one thing led to another and I architected a deal between that company and another a New York based marketing company to buy draft day. So we acquired draft day in 2015. I became the president of draft day and the idea was to pivot draft day from a direct to consumer brand to be more of a B2B white label service provider for regulated gaming companies because casinos and other groups couldn't touch DFS because it was still a little bit gray at that point. Real quick, and, before, before yeah. just for the people listening, when you say you were a, a B2B like white label company for people in the space, can you just like for dummies break that down exactly what that means? Yeah, so the, 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 the angle was we have this great technology. Instead of, instead of somebody going off and building their own, what we would do is we would, like basically the target was any, any company that had a database, that had traffic, that had a bunch of users, but didn't have the, the, the time or the money to build their own DFS platform, but still wanted to try and generate revenues from that DFS user, uh, or, the, or sorry, the user in their database that they thought they can convert into Daily Fantasy. What a white label platform would do is effectively allow them to, we would put their logo on the screen and it would look and breathe like it was that company's DFS site, but we would handle all of the operations. We would handle all of the, you know, basically all the, all the nuts and bolts. It would, so, it, it, it would it, I, 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 yeah, it. I totally get what you mean. So you're basically lending out your proprietary technology and they're able to use it for their audience base. So how does that, when you, when you said, prior in the last section, you said that licensing out what you guys were doing in that first company to other media companies was a bad idea. How does that differ from what you were just talking about? Because that, that seems like the same thing, no? Similar, but the biggest difference is when you're licensing something out to a media company versus a white label to a gaming company, the biggest difference is what the consumer does. When you're licensing to a media company, the consumer is not paying a dollar, right? You're not, there's no revenue being generated from users, from consumers. Okay. When you're white labeling for another company to drive their own DFS site, or quite frankly, there are a number of other white label examples of, of how B2B enterprise SaaS works. Typically, the user on their end is paying a dollar, right? So there is a revenue opportunity direct to consumer. So gotcha. you're not reliant on a sponsor, you're relying on a user. So the difference is to get a sponsor to be willing to pay just, you know, $10,000, you need to have, you know, a thousand users, let's just gotcha. say, okay. you know, but so until you, until you can reach a critical mass of eyeballs, it's going to be challenging to generate $1 which is sponsor revenue through a broadcaster. When you're white labeling something where a consumer is actually going to spend money, well, guess what? You're making money as of user one, gotcha. you know, based on your deal, right? Okay. Does makes that make sense. sense? Yeah, it totally makes sense. That was just like a, a curious question from, from my side.
Makes sense. Yeah, I'm trying to think of a, a good B two B example. Well, I mean, a good, I'm trying to think of a good B two B example from a white label perspective. I mean, there are a bunch of content companies, even in the fantasy space, that power white label offerings for other for other parts. You can think of like USA Today's fantasy content is powered by a uh, third party, right? NBC NBC Sport Edge, I think it's called now, which used to be you know Roto World, is powered by a third party. Yeah, right. I, I got so, you. And, and those, yeah, those are like when you go on to Yahoo, if you play on Yahoo, right? Like when you pull up, like every, anytime there's like a new note on a player or something, you click the little like, you know, red lit up notepad, you click it, it'll show you the newest update. That update is pulled, I think, from NBC Sports Edge. So I, yeah, I, I get what you're saying there. Correct. And 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 that's, there, there are a number of white label fantasy sports platforms and technology companies out there. Okay. Um, and so if you want to get into the fantasy space, the decision that you need to make is, do I want to build it or do I want to buy it? If you buy it, what you're doing is, yeah, you can get to market a heck of a lot faster, mm -hmm. but the feature, but you don't control your technology. So if you want certain features, if you want to control certain things, ultimately you're, you're, you're reliant on convincing that technology company that you license that software from to develop that for you and most likely for the other partners that they have sold their platform to. Gotcha. So you don't have any control around product. And at the end of the day, I think, I think what we're learning, I mean, what we're learning now is that there is, there is a premium on building your own and owning your own tech. But at the other side, what I think Monkey Knife Fight has shown is there's also significant value that can be garnered by building up a powerful brand. Well, so if you think, I think you can I build think like the most success, sorry to cut you off. I, I feel like there's no, no. the most successful brands or the ones who are going to win out over the next five, 10 years are the ones who are able to put a bridge between both of them, own the platform, own the technology, own the audience, own the brand. So like from where I sit, I have, I'm, you know, I'm building the audience. It would make sense for me. Obviously we don't have like the capital to do anything like this, but like five, 10 years, I'm thinking of, how do I cut out, you know, the products that are sponsored on my channel, right? Companies that reach out to me and say like, Hey, we want to hit your audience. I, I'm, I'm, I want to make that company. I want, I want to, I want to start that company and I already have the built in audience. So I feel like once you can connect the two bridges there, right? Like it is valuable to have one or the other. And obviously you have expertise in one or the other, but the brands I think that have the, the ceiling of being a real elite player in the space are the ones that probably have the infrastructure for, you know, the audience, the technology, the service or the platform, right? I think that the most valuable, I think the most valuable thing right now is building audience and creating an audience that you're authentic with, that you're genuine with, mm -hmm. that that is loyal to you. Retention, I mean, everyone, you know, in the gambling space, loyalty is so massive. In the fantasy space, it is as well, mm -hmm. but there's a lot less there. I mean, it, there are fewer fantasy companies in existence right now than there will be gambling companies in five years. Like yeah. there's going to be so many. And ultimately it's what's funny is products are very different, but in the grand scheme of things, they're all pretty similar, right? The thing that separates a good technology platform from another good technology platform, I believe is brand, is identity, is voice, is vision, is marketing approach, right? Because ultimately there are savvy people that understand that Oh, I like this feature on this site more than this feature on the other site. But ultimately, you begin to win the battle by being able to get somebody to your site or to your product in the first place. And what's it, it's like do how that? you got how you you know the, the, the two technologies are kind of the same. Once you're on the site, maybe a little bit different. You might like one or the other. But I, I do agree with you. I think it's almost like what brought you to the site in the first place, and that bridge, like whatever that is is more so the deciding factor than what the actual tool is. There's a reason why we named the company Monkey Knife Fight, right? How many fantasy companies either have the word draft or the word fan in their name, right? Like they're all, with no disrespect, they're all the same. Dude, I mean, same, yes, same. they're- Big dog there are very, same, same thought process. Yeah, there are variations of the same type of product, but they're all in the same realm. Why Monkey Knife Fight? Well. Because when you see the word monkey knife fight behind a home plate at Miller Park during a Brewers game, you're like, what the hell is that? Yeah. I'm going to, I want to Google, like the best tweets I ever saw really in relation to some of the sponsorship tests and sponsorship partner or partnerships we did last year was on, on, on Twitter when someone would say, 
I don't know what the hell monkey knife fight is, but okay, you got me. I'm going to Google it. <laughs> yeah. Done. Right. That, that, at the end of the day, that's what you want because you know, there are, there are so many different, there are so many different options from a gaming perspective out there. What we want to do is we want first just to get noticed. And then we want to try and figure out how we can onboard or how we can create a flow that reduces a barrier to entry or increases a conversion opportunity because something is easy, right? We, we want something to be understood, not, not, the, not an easy gameplay to win or not an easy to understand. I think that's the, that's the first main challenge is can you explain what you are to a user within their, you know, after they Google something, they click a link, they go to a website. Can you explain what you are to them very quickly because a user's attention is so small? We don't do it perfectly. I, I, sometimes we haven't even done it well. We're so new, we're so young. What I pride Monkey Knife Fight's team, and we have an incredible team, and we're very small, is testing and not being scared to test things. If you're scared to test, if you're scared to fail, if you're scared to risk a little bit of money, it, it's going to be a lot harder to figure out and to, to, to really identify those things that are going to work for you the best, right? Well, let me ask you then, like for someone who's obviously passionate about branding and understanding that it's so important to separate yourself via branding, you know, from a top level, like you guys have a much higher marketing budget than, you know, a small time content creator. You test these different things and you've had a, a bunch of like unique marketing tactics that you've used before. Branding is not direct response. So you don't get an immediate sale from it. You don't get an immediate user. So you're testing, right? And you're like, don't be afraid to do it. How do you guys as an actual company as a whole, I guess, measure branding marketing tactics without having like real KPIs behind it? Well, because there are certain there are certain platforms that do provide you with those KPIs, right? So, you know, I would say to you, you know, it's it's difficult to it's difficult to gauge what the monkey knife fight logo on the outfield wall of Miller Park actually translated into from a cost of acquisition perspective. Mm -hmm. It's a challenge, right? But what I can tell you is our conversion on Facebook and on Google was more efficient in the Wisconsin market than it was in most other states. And that is, I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a believer in Occam's razor, right? And for, you know, it's the, the simplest explanation is typically the right one, right? And I, I may have bastardized exactly what Occam's razor is, but that's the gist, right? So because our, our cost of user acquisition or our CPA in markets where we had branding in ballparks or, you know, related to broadcast or other elements, our KPIs on Facebook, on Google, on some of the other platforms where there is tracking, where we can identify what a, what a, what a, what a true cost of a depositor is, as an example, those were lower and they're lower because as you said, a user, a consumer needs to be, you know, hit over the head by something a number of times before they're willing to act. Right. Somebody has to see monkey knife fight five to 10 times before they really want or before they are activated to go to the website or to click a link more often than not. Right. So where it's a challenge is trying to piece all those pieces, you know, trying to turn, trying to, to tie everything together to get a real snapshot as to what a specific marketing expense was. But and, and quite frankly, for a small company like ours, it's not easy all the time, right? Do you guys do work with a third party like marketing agency for this stuff or you do everything in house? No, we've worked with a number of really great marketing companies. Funny enough, we started working with Hot Paper Lantern, which remember, I don't know if you remember our that yeah. steak dinner that we started. Ed, I went Ed, out with Ed 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 for, for pizza like a couple months after that, actually. No, in the city. Ed's, yeah. Ed's, Ed's the man. His team's mm -hmm. incredible. So you know, that dinner that we were at in Vegas, it was you and it was Ed and it was a couple guys from our team. And then we started working together shortly after. So there's a good pitch for FSGA. Everyone should go to the conference in Dallas if it's going to happen in June, because it's going to be awesome. Yeah, I also sit on the board of the FSGA. So there's my <laughs> compulsory sales. And if you're not a member of the FSGA, you should really, you should really think about becoming members because I mean, 
shit, we became business partners because we met at the FSJ. Right? I'm not even an FSJ that. member, to be honest. I wasn't really even supposed to be at that conference. I just like happened to be, <laughs> I happened to, dude, like, it's actually funny because the only reason I really, I was traveling at the time already. I was, uh, I went, to, it was like the season had ended and I was like, I, you know, I'm like kind of, I'm kind of burnt out from like football shit. So I want to get out of like the New York area. It's depressing in the winter or whatever. So I was down in Florida. I went to like New Orleans for the college football national championship the night before I met you guys in Vegas. And I had been in touch with Zach and he was just like, yo, it'd be cool if, uh, are you going to the FSGA? It'd be cool to like meet you and you'd be able to sit down with like the team and everything. And I was like, I'm already traveling. I wasn't planning on going to the FSGA, but like, if you guys are going to be there, like, I'm not going to just say no to Vegas for no reason. So I went there for the last night. Yeah. And it was like, it was fantastic. I had a, I had a fucking blast, but it was just, you know, I'm not a member of it, but it's definitely something that like, I, I went into it thinking like, you know, I, I don't know if this was for me. I don't really, I'm, 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 I'm much more focused on like, building my own personal community within my audience than I am focusing on like the fantasy community as a whole. But I realize how important these kind of networking events are in a physical space. And it, it was a lot cooler than I, uh, I had actually imagined it to be up front. Well, look how entrepreneurial you are, right? Eh? And honest. And that's the other thing. I like working with good people at the end of the day, right? And there are some really great people in the fantasy and the sports gaming industry. And quite frankly, there's some really shitty people too. Yeah. Um, and, and really, you know, it's, it's all about trying to find those good people. So I, I love the fact that you just admitted not being an FSGA member to an FSGA board member and you were <laughs> at the conference. That's great. I fucking love it. Oh, sorry. I don't know if I'm allowed to swear. Uh, you're, you're allowed to, you're allowed to fucking swear uh, as much uh, as you uh, want. Uh, I'm a, I'm a salty, I'm a salty Canadian. That's um, perfect. Let him so know. yeah, I mean, I think there you go. So I, I think that, you know, when it comes back to the being able to, to measure which channels can convert best you know best users and 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 the, and the best kpis i mean it it is a challenge these days to be able to to do that for a small company when you don't have all the tools to measure every single touch point in real time all the same but i will say and and this is one of the a lot of people have asked me you know because I've, I've 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 run a couple companies i've tried to do the startup thing a number of times you know why monkey knife fight why has monkey knife fight been such a success and i mean i've been very fortunate we have an incredible team. We had an incredible owner. I think that one of the one of the reasons, like honestly, is we had an owner who was a risk taking serial entrepreneur who contributed and invested uh, a significant amount of capital. So we were able to test things without the fear of failing. And by me, by that, by by that, I mean, you know, if you're a, if you're a startup and you have X amount of dollars in capital. If you if you fail, or if one of the things that you spend your 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 limited resources on doesn't work, well, you're jeopardizing payroll, you're jeopardizing your team, you're jeopardizing your survival. We were very fortunate where we had we had the funding to make mistakes, right? We made we made plenty of mistakes, you know. But all through this process, the owner, like Bill, incredible, like the, just the greatest guy I've ever worked with. You know, there were always milestones along the way where, you know, he would commit X amount of funding. And if we saw what we wanted to see out of a test or out of a, you know, a couple months, you know, if we saw what we wanted to see from, from, from user engagement, from uh, user acquisition, from action on our site, you know, that would get him excited, right? We would do a deal and the press would be positive and we would keep going and we would continue to grow and grow and grow. And then all of a sudden, we kind of hit that that hockey stick moment, which was probably, I would say, I mean, it was really the like we launched December or sorry, September of 2018. And really that that December, January and that first that first year, it everything just really started taking off. We did a couple affiliate deals. We started working with with uh, with Facebook and the Real Money Gaming team. And that Super Bowl, that first Super Bowl that we had in 2019, it was just like, wow, okay. This is pretty cool. And we were only like five or six people at that point. And then we grew, you know, pretty tactically to the next football season. So in September of 2019, and then kind of that, you know, football season last year, like 2019 through the 2020 Super Bowl was, I mean, that was, that was crazy. It was a really, really exciting time, which kind of led to those awards. And then this year, when we started doing all of our team deals and we started growing really big, I mean, we're like 40 people now. And then, yeah, I mean, led all the way to, you know, we did a big deal with the NFL Players Association, which was like the most proud, getting the deal done with the NFL Players Association, one team, 
partners that you know works very closely with a with a slew of the players associations just the smartest guys some of the smartest guys that were girls smartest people i've ever met regardless of industry just period being able to get that deal done was was so exciting and it's been incredible to work with them and then you know pushing toward the acquisition with valleys i mean it's just been it's been an unbelievable year not to mention that i finished second in the uh canadian national best ball champions league i mean come on what did what did that uh what did that win you just that hat won me a hat in a sweatshirt but it's i wear this hat with pride not just i'm a canadian but i'm a fantasy player too i mean that's the thing nick like i'm i'm legit man like i, I love this <laughs> fantasy stuff i'm i'm, I'm in are, a are dynasty you pitch, are you pitching right yourself now. as a content you're trying to come onto my youtube channel now as a, as a fantasy content creator is this happening I joined my first dynasty start. I've I've been doing fantasy leagues forever, right? But I finally did what started or jump wanted to jump into dynasty for the first time. So I literally because I'm in a keeper league with a bunch of my friends forever, but not dynasty. I've always been a little bit nervous about dynasty, but I jumped into a dynasty league and literally I'm in a dynasty draft right now. And, and uh, oh, in a I startup a, draft right now. In a startup draft right now, it's a 14 team. It's a 14 team super flex premium tight end and I was given the 12th pick Amazing. and I was like I'm not I'm not having this so I traded up to get Kyler at pick two because oh, just uh, word of it word of advice you never trade up early on in the startup drafts always trade move move back around pick up next year's first round pick pick up trade your first for a second a fifth a six or something yeah, like that so this is this was my stra- this was my strategy looking at because I like to I like to win I like to win now New- newcomers always do this people who, who who do their first dynasty draft always trade up in the first round because they see the enticing names always bites you in the long run yeah but what I what, the way I thought about the startup draft because this is like a 30 player 30 player roster regardless what I wanted to do is I wanted to get two really young quarterbacks to anchor the super flex team Fair. and then what I wanted to do is I actually traded a bunch of my picks over the next couple of years because of how deep because of how big the rosters were what I wanted to do was anchor with two strong quarterbacks it was it was super flex so I wanted two young or and tight end premium I wanted two young tight ends as well and then picking up a bunch of young uh, second year and third year players because of the the startup nature of the draft i want to if i figured it would give me a good couple years to 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 run with this roster and then have my draft picks a couple years out so i wanted to get as strong of a core team as i could early on knowing that i mean the rosters are so deep. I'm sure that was uh, it's going to bite me in the butt, but you know, uh, yeah, I, I kind of like where I'm at right now. We're, we're we're not good at we're not good at picking games in inside of a one weekend span <laughs> as fantasy players. So to think that we know what's going to happen three years down the road is just is just a ridiculous thing. But we we're not going to dive into this. The series no. is not about players, <laughs> not about fantasy. So we can't start going down that road. Otherwise, it's going to be a long conversation <laughs> in, in that sense. So one. The owner sounds like a fantastic guy. I need to find myself a, a, a bill, I guess, out there. And, you know, you guys have, as you said, you, you've been very disruptive in the space. Now, just just like quickly, DFS versus gambling and sports betting, right? This is something that confused me because if I'm working with, you know, I'm working with you guys. I've been working with best ball platforms. I've worked with like FanDuel or DraftKings before. And it, it, it's tough for me to like remember which states I'm allowed to like plug things in and which states different members are or different users or people in my audience are allowed to play different games for. And I'll just get like, Oh, can I play here? Can I play here? And I'm just like, I don't, I don't know what this site is actually labeled as if they're a sports gambler, if they're daily, you know what I mean? It gets, it gets a crazy. So like real quickly difference between daily fantasy and gambling in the sense of why is daily fantasy not considered gambling in your opinion? And are there multiple like categories of that? Like, why wouldn't all daily fantasy sports websites be allowed in the same states? Is there, is that just like some don't have the capital to get the licensing fees for that? Or I know like sports gambling, it's tough to get the fee. There's just a lot going on here. So if you can break it down, like as simple as you possibly could, that'd be kind of great to lay some groundwork going forward. Sure. I mean, uh, so I, I'll start here. So, I mean, as far as state by state goes, there are there are a whack of states out there that don't allow any fantasy sports for real money. Period. Mm-hmm. Whether it's DFS or whether it's even I think any any style of DFS. Yeah, I, I believe even sites that offer season long fantasy that are for real money, they're not allowed. 
there's a there's like I think 10 states like that. From a gambling perspective, obviously sports gambling is not legal in in every state yet. It's starting to roll out nationally. In those states, to your point, it will be it's very expensive to get a license to operate in those states. From a fantasy perspective, there's a lot of variety. And I don't why don't we don't need to get too inside baseball here, but by all means ask specific questions if I don't answer it to your to your liking. Every state kind of is different. I mean, there's a bunch of states where DFS is just legal, or I should say is 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 I guess unregulated based on a 2006 piece of legislation called the UIGEA UGEA was effectively the piece of legislation that killed poker and real money gaming in the states. There was a carve out for fantasy sports stating that fantasy sports was still allowable, was still um, permitted. And within that carve out in 2006 for fantasy sports, there were a number of definitions as to what classified something as fantasy sports. And without getting too detailed, multiple player, multiple team, accumulating statistics and a fixed buy-in and a fixed prize, meaning it can't, what you can win can't change once you've entered a contest. So as long as you fit within that framework, you are classified as daily fantasy sports. So one of the things that's interesting is that now you're, st- over the last couple of years, you're starting to see a bunch of new interpretations or new styles of daily fantasy sports. The way I like to think of it is that you have your traditional daily fantasy sports, which is your salary cap based, you know, platform that was obviously made extraordinarily popular by the FanDuel's and the DraftKings of the world. Draft Day, the company that I used to run had a very similar product. And there are still tons of salary cap based traditional daily fantasy sports companies. Now, where you're starting to see best ball, you're starting to see fantasy prop games. These all still fit within the definition of that carve out. And so they are deemed a game of skill and therefore are permissible in the states where daily fantasy sports is permitted. Some states have enacted regulations and legislation to require companies to have licenses. And in those states, yeah, there are some states that have very expensive license fees. So not every company in the DFS space can afford to operate there. And so it is confusing from a user perspective. And it is confusing from a content provider's perspective, because you work with a lot of platforms and you you recommend play to your users on certain sites. And unfortunately, some users and some of your audience in those states just can't play. And I think that the I think that the DFS player, I think that they're, they're used to it, right? If they're in a state that unfortunately, has a very high license fee. As as an example, Missouri. Missouri requires fantasy companies to um, to pay a fifty thousand dollar license fee. Like that's a lot of money. So a lot of users even say to us, like, why aren't you guys in Missouri? Obviously, we're we're working towards getting live in 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 a lot of different states. But for for a lot of startups, what users don't understand is a fifty thousand dollar license fee in one specific state needs to be offset by the amount of revenue that you think that you think you're going to be able to generate from those users in that state right. right so you know when you when you think about how much money a fantasy company typically generates per user that's a lot of you got to acquire a ton of users right so unless you're a company that has a huge uh, amount of funding it, it becomes a challenge and even if you have a lot of funding you know even from you know monkey knife fight wasn't in a lot of these these bigger states. And so even though we had funding, you know, we're still a business, right? So who wants to spend money where it, you're not going to be able to get a return on that investment? So what, how do you choose, how do you choose which states you go by? Like states that have sports teams, states that, you know, are like dedicated to sports or fantasy sports in general population. Like what, what, what exactly are you looking at to decide which states are worth it? Well, I mean, I think all of those, I mean, all of those factors come into, come into, come into play. Population, do they have professional sports teams? You know, wh- who are some of the content providers in those states that you might be able to create partnerships with? Because ultimately, you know, if you're looking at a $50,000 license fee just to get into a, to a state, 
it's not an if you build it, they will come scenario. Just because right. you go live in this state doesn't mean people are going to find you right away. So the equation also needs to include the amount of marketing resources you need to launch your brand in a specific state. So even working with a group like, you know, big dogs. So let's say we turn on state X and you, know, you as big dogs know you have a number of users in that state. So yeah, you're going to be able to send an email to those users in the state say, hey, by the way, Monkey Knife Fight's now live in, in your state go in and play. Well, you and I both know that even an email to a user is not going to get them to convert right away, right? So even if Monkey Knife Fight has 100 affiliates in a specific state and have users in their database that are aware of Monkey Knife Fight and all of those affiliates agree to send an email to all those users in those states to say, hey, guess what? Monkey Knife Fight is now live in that state. There's no guarantee that we're going to convert all of those users. So we have to augment that with a Facebook spend, with a Google spend, potentially with some radio spots. Broadcast is expensive. So ultimately, are there regional? Because um, I, I say radio because radio is regional, like podcasts are national, right? So the question is, where can you tactically find some of those regional marketing outlets, right? Do you do us? Do you do you employ street teams to? walk around the bar district in the downtown core wearing monkey knife fight shirts, yeah. giving out flyers. Like, I mean, but this is, this is all the types of things that a company needs to think about when they're launching. It's not as simple as pay $50,000 and you're in a state, right? There's so many other pieces. That's just like the, the starting point. Yeah. I mean, just because totally, you're live right? in a state doesn't mean you're going to stay alive in that state. So yeah, it seems like a very confusing fucking aspect to, uh, to a lot of this stuff. So to be honest with you, I would not, I would not want to be in your position. I mean, I, I'd like to be in your position, but not, you know, from the ground up, it's it's a difficult task to overcome. It is. And I think that's part of the reason why we named our company Monkey Knife Fight. Because our thought was, when you see somebody walking down the street wearing a Monkey Knife Fight t-shirt, you're like, hmm, okay, you, you remember that. And then when you see the email from Big Dog saying, Monkey Knife, go play on Monkey Knife, you're like, oh, wait, I know that name somewhere. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, my, my recommendation to anyone that's trotting out there, you know, don't use the word draft or fan or prize or whatever, or picks fantasy in your name. or, or, or road. Granted, yeah, granted, all those things. Yeah. I mean, and, and I mean, not trying to throw, throw shade on prize picks because Adam is a friend of mine. Great, great guy, great company, but those names have all been used, right? Do something different, right? Like I'm, I'm buddies with Jeremy Levine. Jeremy is probably the, most successful founder in the history of fantasy sports because he's done it a number of times. For those of you that don't know, he was Star Street and then he was Draft and now Underdog. Jeremy and I laugh all the time because it's like Monkey Knife Fight and Underdog. We want to create an association of animal branded fantasy companies. You know, it's like you two, that's, you two are that's what like, you gotta do. yeah, you two are the only real affiliates I've ever worked with draft before underdog. And now like it's, un it's exclusively underdog and monkey knife fight. And Jeremy's actually going to be on the series probably in two to three episodes. So I'm actually really excited to kind of dig into what he has going on as well. But yeah, I mean, I, I could see the similarities between what you guys are doing in terms of like different, uh, differentiating yourself. So it's been interesting to watch from an outsider's perspective. Dude, Jeremy's uh, yeah, Jeremy's a, uh, Jeremy's a maniac. Love that guy. Yeah. He's a beast. So listen, like you guys, are everywhere now and the scale that you've had from an outsider's perspective probably goes overlooked from what's going on behind the scenes so i'm i'm very very from from like an individual content creator's point of view like i i do consider myself someone who just makes youtube videos but the bigger we grow and the more we scale i start to think of things as what are you pointing out over there what was that oh i i like giving partners shout outs there you prize, go. Out. prize out okay there you go okay i want to split of uh whatever royalties you get from that one <laughs> no i'm starting to think of us more as like a media company right so i do eventually want to scale this to more than just one kid being youtube uh you know being on youtube and i have friends that are helping me out we do have multiple channels going on we're selling different things and like we are scaling up a little bit but like i'm, I'm so intrigued by the 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 essence of, of scaling from a from a company's perspective now you guys started in 2018. How many people did you start with? And you guys started completely remotely, correct? Yeah, we actually, the Monkey Knife Fight, the company started actually July of 2017 was when Bill and I and, and, and a couple other core people started working on this together. We tested a couple ideas, a couple brand names just to play around with, with stuff. 
we decided on the Monkey Knife Fight brand and, and what our product was going to be, uh, and then launched Monkey Knife Fight in September of 2018. At that point, we were, I think we were five people, six people. What we did was in order to get us out, uh, you know, we licensed a back end code that I was familiar with, that our head of product, an incredible guy, Scott Malwig, who's been, who I've worked with from the draft day days. I've been working with Scott longer than I think I've worked with anybody. Scott came over and then we built Monkey Knife Fight on top of that code base. We were six people leading into the playoffs of the 2018 2019 season, leading into the Super Bowl of 2019. Shit freaking exploded and we were six people bill and i we make this joke all the time literally we were drinking from a fire hose and and then we started scaling up from six people i think we were i want to say we were like 15 people by the start of the football season in 2019 uh, and now we're we're 40 people that's it the monkey knife fight's always been remote i live in toronto canada a, a majority of our team lives in the states mm -hmm. so I met Bill Asher, who's the owner of Mug, or I guess he's not the owner of Monkey to Wall. He's the owner of Monkey Knife Fight for another like month, uh, and then Bally's is the official owner because the, the deal hasn't uh, deal won't close for a few more weeks. I met Bill when I was running Draft Day, um, just over the phone, and then we started working together to build Monkey Knife Fight in 2017, July of 2017. I actually met Bill face to face for the first time October of 2019. And he had already invested $8 million of his own money into Monkey Knife Fight. Wow. And we had met face to face. Quite frankly, Bill's not a tech guy. So we had never did Zooms or anything. It was literally, we knew what each other looked like from pictures. That's it. And so I remember meeting him. It was at G2E, like the Global Gaming Expo in Vegas. We went October of 2019. You're just always just, in finding excuses to go to Vegas, huh? You know what? I'm not, ironically, I'm not really, a, I mean, I, I, I don't gamble. You know, I'm sure I'll play a little blackjack here and there, but. But uh, ask Ed the next time you talk to him about our, our little blackjack experience together in Vegas. And, and it was like the best experience from a gaming perspective I've ever had. I, was, I felt very lucky. I, but I like, I like the food, right? <laughs> like I, Vegas is good, yeah, man. Yeah. Like Vegas is, I like the energy of Vegas. I'm not a, I play poker, but just with my buddies, like I'll get destroyed if I played with like pros, whatever. But I mean that, but meeting Bill there was, it was, it was really funny. But yeah, I mean, there are people on the Monkey Knife Fight team that I've worked with for two and a half years that I've never met face to face. Slack is, if it wasn't for Slack, Monkey Knife Fight wouldn't exist. So that's simple. Slack has become the greatest tool for us to manage, for me to manage the team. You know, we have weekly calls. You know, I'm a big believer in communication. Sure, I'm the president of Monkey Knife Fight, but I don't like the word boss. I don't like you know, I don't like that terminology. We're a team. You know, we talked about rugby, right? I, I, I played rugby for, for many years. I mean, I played lots of sports. Rugby was the one I played at university. The thing about rugby that I've always loved the most is unlike football, we use American football as the example. If you're an offensive line, if you're whatever position you play in football, there's a play coming up. You know what your job is for the next 20 seconds. Mm -hmm. You do your job, then play stops, breathe. You get your next play, you do your next job. Rugby never stops. So in rugby, you have, you know, it, as the game progresses, if you notice that your teammate has fallen or your teammate was tackled and hasn't gotten back up again, and the other team is coming down the field, you all have to work together to compensate for what's happened to another team member, right? You need to literally work as a unit to score a try and to defend your defend against the other team scoring a try, which is a touchdown effectively in rugby. So what I like, you know, I really believe in that philosophy in in building team and in coordinating and, and whatever, being responsible for a team. We all have to work together. And so Slack has been an incredible tool. You know, obviously we do video calls and things like that now, but everyone I really want, and I think it's essential for everyone on a team to understand what everybody's responsibilities are because there are going to be moments when you may be asked to help to fill in to compensate for you know somebody getting sick or quite frankly to take advantage of an opportunity where it's like oh my gosh we got to do this hey let's all come together so you know i think that building a remote team now obviously is a heck of a lot easier than it was shit a year ago two years ago right. and i think with the pandemic has forced all of us to understand is how can 
working remotely be successful? So the thing that you know, the thing that I'll take away from the pandemic more than anything else is I think from a workforce perspective, people and employers are now way more open to thinking about hiring people who might be the best for the job, not necessarily the people that are in the city where the job is core located. I think employers are starting to open their minds to that a little bit. I mean, yes, I would be foolish to discount what it's like all being in the same office. Yeah. But I will say, I Monkey Knife Fight has never had an office. So can you build a successful company without ever being in the same space? Well, the answer is yes, because Monkey Knife Fight is proof of that. I'm not saying that we wouldn't have been better or faster if we were all in the same space, but I think the pandemic has definitely shifted people's perceptions of how work can be done successfully, I'm as really opposed to how- yeah, I'm I'm really interested to see how the workforce adapts to this over the next like two to three years. I think for a long time it was like the complete opposite stigma, where it was like everybody needs to. You were, you know, you guys are very very rare case in the sense that like you are okay doing everything remotely. Where most places are like, no, like you can't. We don't want you to work from home, even if you know, even if you're sick. Like nine to five, be here. No other alternatives to it. The quarantine happened, and everyone's expected to work from home nine to five every day. And I think a lot of employers will probably take that as like, oh, we can do what Monkey Knife Fight did and we can operate fully. But I think they'll eventually fall back on the fact that there is some importance, I think, to some kind of physical location for a lot of these other jobs. And I, I think we'll meet somewhere in the middle of the spectrum where it was like too intense before. It's probably a little bit too much now where even like from an employee happiness standpoint, I think a lot of people like I live in New York. So a lot of my friends obviously had to quarantine starting when the, the weather got warm, like Mayish, right? So they're all like, I could do this work from home thing forever, right? Like the summer's nice. I can go out for walks. I can go to parks. I can go to whatever, do my thing outside. Becomes winter, gets dark at four o'clock. It's cold. It's miserable. It's like, damn, I kind of miss being in the office. I miss having my coworkers around. So I'm just very intrigued by what plays out in the workforce for, you know, globally or, you know, just in America or wherever, Canada over the next couple of years. So it's, it's, it's like wildly impressive. You guys have been able to do this completely, completely remotely. I guess, I guess like I'm, I'm, I'm curious from from someone who's taken a very long time to get to where I'm at right now, and I don't think it's big at all, especially relative to a lot of people in the space, I've always been really, really fascinated or, or, or focused on making sure that the foundation of everything we do is really solidified before we move to the next step. And I realize now that like when you're scaling, sometimes you don't really have a choice but to, you know, jump two steps and figure out what you needed to know that step between like on the go. So when you guys scale from six to 40 in the matter of, uh, in the matter of a year, two years, that one Super Bowl run you guys had that kind of catapulted you to the next level. Do you ever feel like, I mean, obviously you're successful, but you ever feel like you moved maybe too fast in some directions or you learned some, some things like you, you, you miss, you mistakenly kind of skipped out on some foundational pieces of the, of the, whether it's like the team connection or the actual development, like uh, the, the app, the website, the, whatever it is, like you ever felt like you scaled too quickly and, and skipped out on some foundational pieces? I mean, to be honest, Monkey Knife Fight sold for $90 million three weeks ago. So no, <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, that's, I, and I'm not like, no, no, I didn't, I didn't I take mean, it that way. No. And you know, it, it's, it, it's a really great, great question. I mean, yeah, there were some, there were some mistakes from a, from a personal perspective that were made, but I will say, I mean, there are an incredible core group of people that I rely on. I mean, the owner bill has relied on and I've relied on from an operations perspective. I think that if it wasn't for seven or eight of these core people who were literally like the first seven or eight people who we just you know, hired, you know, kind of, we brought on to their teams. I don't think this would have been successful. I, I've, I've learned to rely on these people. I mean, I mentioned Scott Malwig before, but you know, kind of our, our de facto heads of, of technology, Peter Keynes and, and, and Roy, his name's Nil and Day Roy. I mean, they're brilliant. Like they are, and then Todd Stender, who, who who runs our operations. I mean, these these guys, and there are many many others on our team, and and you know, everyone on our team call every day, like or every week. You know, I I, I think everyone on Team Monkey Knife Fight knows what I think about them. But these these core people are exceptional, and if it wasn't for them, I don't think we would have been able to scale because I don't have the time 
to manage every single person. But what I do, I need to trust the people that are working with me. And I trust those four guys. And, you know, we have a, a new head of marketing who I've known for, for, for many years, who joined our team formally recently. Uh, you know, Josh, there you go. There's your shout out. Uh, Tepper. And I feel like now I've got to name check every single monkey knife fight user or I, I, every monkey knife fight employee. But the, these people are incredible. So I think luck has hit me as an operator with monkey knife fight. One, I met Bill, an incredible guy who we shared a vision and he had he had the money to lose straight up, right? It, it's paid off for him, mm-hmm. but he had the money to lose. I think that I was lucky to find, or not to find, I was lucky that these great people believed in the vision enough to sacrifice, because these guys and, and the girls on our team, like, don't fool yourself, uh, anyone that's watching. Like, in order to build a company like this and to scale, these people, like, vacation, what's vacation? Like, what is a 40-hour work week, let alone an eight, like a 70 to 80-hour work week? Like, no shit. Like these people, we all worked our asses off. And if you're not willing to do that, stop, right? I mean, or I shouldn't say stop, adjust your expectations, right? right? These people, they trusted in me. They trusted in Bill. And I think I got very lucky as an operator that these core individuals were as good as they said they were. (laughs) and were able to assimilate the other incredible people that have joined monkey knife fight onto their teams and uh you know it's it actually does it freaks me out that we've been able to accomplish what we've been able to accomplish with such a small team but i think it's because these core people are rock stars right i mean i've been so fortunate and lucky to be able to work with these people Right. I mean, I, I'm the lucky one. Right. I mean, I got I found, you know, I was able to meet Bill who, who you know, funded this and these people. I don't do any work. I just talk with people like you. Right. Um, <laughs> ultimately, I think that it I think that when you're building company, what I've learned is if you don't think that an individual is right, if you you know, like a partner, a teammate, if that person doesn't fit uh, as hard as it is, you need to change. Right personal emotion, like what I've learned throughout my startup life. And it's, you know, is it's hard to, and I don't like the word fire. I don't like, the, it's hard to be, it's hard to say no. It's hard to disagree with people. Y- you learn as you grow that that's a necessity. If somebody's not right and you, you want to prepare yourself to scale, if you can't trust that that person is going to be able to help manage that scale, if that person's not going to be able to handle it when the budget that you're putting in front of them is 10x, or now they have six people on their team, if you don't think that person can manage that pressure, well, you got to change, right? So I've just been so lucky. Like ultimately, the people on the team, Team Monkey Knife Fight, are just literally the best people I've ever worked with ever, and a lot of them become my friends too, which is challenging. But you know, I believe happy, happy life. Um, you know, of course, happy wife, happy life. But I mean, if you if you enjoy the people, your you wife work doesn't with, work for Monkey Knife, fight, right? Oh gosh, no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my 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 wife doesn't necessarily enjoy sports, which is kind of an odd thing. But that's okay. That's okay. I don't like Jewel. There you go. Fair. There you go, honey. Opposite there you go, honey. Man, as they, as <laughs> there they you say, go. Apparently, uh, opposite to track. But anyway, yeah. So I mean, I think that you know, I've been this whole process has been extraordinarily lucky but it's it's all about the people right and if yeah. you're if, if you enjoy the people you're working with you're gonna be willing to work a little bit more a little bit harder yeah right enjoy, so, enjoy who you're working with and and when you believe in the ultimate goal it's, it's easy to work for because it feels like you know there's a lot more passion behind it and it's it's much more natural right like i think in, intent is a really thing a uh, really big thing that you can't measure necessarily but you'd be surprised how far it goes when it comes to the different kpis that you can measure and clearly you know you guys have been successful through this scaling, as you mentioned, the acquisition by Bailey's for the $90 million wasn't even actually aware of the number. That's a staggering number. Now, I I, I didn't even kind of really put it on the show sheet, the acquisition, but I would like to dive into that because that's pretty pretty fascinating. So what's what's the 
I guess, thought pr uh, process or strategy behind. I mean, obviously they throw that number at you. You're going to be like, oh, you know, I got to listen to this. Let's, let's, let's hear what, let's hear what their plans are for monkey knife fight. Cause you know, as you build something, it's like, it's your baby. You don't just want to give it away for a, a money sign, but the bigger picture here has to be something that moves you guys forward quickly. Right. So what's the, what's the idea behind getting uh, acquired by Bailey's like, what's the, the growth strategy afterwards? Well, and, and this is all on the internet. So, or it's all public. So, I mean, the, the deal was a stock deal. So we sold monkey knife fight for ballast stock. Um, the reason why the owner bill and I got so excited about the Bally's opportunity is Bally's is run. The Bally's corporation is being run by some of the smartest people I've ever met in my entire life. They are visionaries and they have a significant plan that we fully believe in. So when you think of the North American gaming space right now, you know, Gambling is starting to roll out across the U.S. So, of course, you know, everyone knows, you know, in the states, you know, there's I mean, 16, 15 states where sports gambling is legal. Mobile sports betting is going live in a number of states. We all know the FanDuel, DraftKings. You know, we we all know what's been going on in the gambling space. We also know that a lot of gambling companies are partnering with media companies. We know that some gambling companies are looking at DFS as a great way to accumulate database before certain states go live. So the thing that excited us the most about Bally's is Bally's is the only company in the gaming ecosystem that covers kind of every touch point of a sports fan and an eventual sports gambler. So Bally's owns uh, a number of brick and mortar casinos across the U.S. So they have <clears throat> they have physical locations. Bally's recently acquired a company called Betworks. Betworks is a proprietary sports betting tech stack. Betworks actually powers the scores betting app. Betworks obviously are uh, incredible technologists and incredible thinkers when it comes to how product in the sports gambling space is going to roll out. And then Bally's did a deal with Sinclair, the regional broadcaster in the US. Within the next month, month and a half, all of the Fox sports nets across the US are gonna be renamed Bally Sportsnet. So now Bally's also has a significant media, you know, touch point with the thinner story. Then Bally's bought Monkey Knife Fight, the third biggest daily fantasy sports company. We are live in 37, 38 states. We are live in states where there is no sports gambling. We have a very cool brand and we are a direct -to consumer product that generates revenue from users who will eventually be converted into sports gamblers in those states where there's sports gambling when Bally's launches after we've launched our betting app. Gotcha. Then Bally's bought Sport Caller, which is a free to play, a white label B2B free to play company. So Sport Caller works with another a number of media companies and gaming brands to create, as they call, top of funnel free-to-play games, right? So now Bally's has every single touch point on the journey of a sports gamer covered from media to free-to-play to DFS to sports gambling to brick and mortar. That's what excites me about Bally's because we, I think we say we now, we are the only company that has that full menu of elements already combined in an entity. And now the Bally's brand is only going to become bigger and broader as we start turning these kind of pieces on. That's, that's, that's the mafia right there, man. You guys got every, every aspect covered. Well, and that's what, I mean, quite frankly, that's why the owner, Bill, and I were so excited about this potential. Right. I mean, we were there were a lot of op other offers that we were looking at. But I mean, when we started digging into what the Bally's plan was, I mean, it it is massive. And yeah. we are so excited to be a part of that journey, along with the incredible, you know, with the other incredible folks about works in Sport Caller and, and Sinclair um, and of obviously the incredible you know team at Bally's, you know, court proper. Yeah. So congrats on the acquisition. That's uh, Thank really you. That's neat stuff. I'm excited to see what, you know, what comes together through all of that. Well, speaking of like partnerships, obviously that's huge partnership and you've had other partnerships with sports teams, professional sports teams, you know, like the Padres, the Bucks, the Dolphins, the Brewers, teams like that. I want to kind of pick apart the difference between how you look at things when partnering with a major sports team 
versus partnering with like affiliates like myself. Now, I'm not even sure if you really have any hand into, you know, what goes on with like someone like me as someone, you know, obviously much smaller, smaller, smaller reach than like a, an NFL team or an MLB team or something like that. I would I would venture to assume that like individual content creators like myself within your direct space push the needle forward more than some of these actual NFL sports teams. So I'm, I'm curious, I could be wrong on that, but like, I'm curious the, the reasoning behind partnering with like a, a, an NFL team or an MLB team, is that like an optics thing? It gives you legitimacy. It gives you legitimacy to, you know, the audience, but also like potential maybe investors down the line. And what are those deals? Like, how do those deals come together? First of all, between like a team and yourself and like, what 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 goes into that? Like, is, is there a whole lot of money that gets transferred over to the team? And like, what do you guys get in return for that? So, okay, that, that's a big question. So first we'll go back to the reasoning why kind of sports team partnerships and how um, kind of uh, we would view them in relation to like big dogs. So you hit the nail on the head. A lot of it, uh, some of it, especially for Monkey Knife Fight in the early days was legitimacy, right? Credibility and legitimacy, we are the official daily fantasy sports partner of the Milwaukee Brewers, as an example, which to me, that was our first real big one. Uh, incredible folks at Milwaukee. The legitimacy and credibility that came with that was massive. And it really did open up the floodgate to building relationships with a number of other sports teams across you know, every pro league. I, get, I think that maybe the easiest way to think about this is we'll, we'll, we'll take the other angle, like working with a big dogs, right? If I'm if I were to work with a big dogs, I know who your user is. I know that your user is a dedicated fantasy and daily fantasy sports user, right? So I know that working with you, I'm going to be able to cultivate a depositing user from you, most likely more efficiently than spending a lot of money, spending five to six figures with the professional sports team to become the official partner and have logos on walls and, and home plate, right? The difference is reach. And the difference is the way that I kind of think of it is like the Holy grail. The Holy grail of the sports gaming company is the casual sports fan. No disrespect to all of the incredible fantasy sports partners that we work with, they you have casual sports fans but you have casual sports fans who are already fantasy players we know what the market size of that audience is the holy grail from a sports gaming perspective has always been cultivating and converting the casual sports fan onto your platform so the reality is there are let's say you know you know, there's 50 to 60 million season long fantasy players in North America. Let's say there's five to 7 million daily fantasy sports players. I mean, those numbers, different people claim they're different, but let's just, let's just use those as easy, right? But there are 400 million Americans. There are what, 200 million or so, 250 million fans of sports, right? Maybe more. So the key is how can you stretch not only past daily fantasy sports users to season long users and then to the casual users. I would argue that putting our logo behind a home plate in Miller Park is gonna allow us to stretch our brand potential and our user acquisition potential wider than it would be working with a fantasy content partner, even though the fantasy content partner will bring us more kind of secure FTE. It, it's almost like branding API. versus it's like branding versus direct response again, right? It, 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 it's it's a hundred percent right. We look at things at Monkey Knife Fight. We're building brand. We're acquiring customers, right? There are two different slides. There's two different sides of the equation. You can't build a multi-million dollar, billion-dollar business without also building brand. You just, you can't, right. right? You can build a nice business but you're not gonna build a disruptive business, right? I view Monkey Knife Fight as a sports lifestyle brand that happens to have a daily fantasy sports platform, right? I believe Monkey Knife Fight can do to the sports industry what, and I've said this before, but what Beats by Dre did to the headphones industry. Beats by Dre aren't the best headphones from a technology perspective, but that brand blew up. 
when you think about technology and wearables, they made a specific type of headphone cool, right? I believe the monkey knife fight from a lifestyle and a brand perspective can actually create a higher ceiling for us than a majority of other gaming groups out there because um, we aren't just reliant on driving users to play on monkey knife fight. I want people, you know, I want people watching, going to our Twitter feed because it's a, it's a, it's a genuine conversation, right? And this is what I love so much to bring this back to you a little bit. This is what I love so much about big dogs. Uh, personally, what I like about you, and there are a number of other fantasy sites that I, as a as as a fan, respond to because you're genuine, you're authentic, you're real, right? When you say something, I listen. I I, I want to engage, right? There are enough. With the future of sports gambling, what's it going to be based on? Right? Is it going to be based on who has the the best odds, who has the best loyalty, like the best like free money promos. I think that brand and 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 I mean obviously loyalty and retention are going to be so important, but I think brand is so important. If you can create a cool experience, if you can create a cool brand, you're going to be able to you're going to be able to separate yourself from every other, you know, hamburger joint and pizza joint there is because hey, pizza's bread, you know, dough Tomatoes, tomato sauce, cheese, and some toppings. Yeah, cooked at, a different, cooked at a different temperature, cooked for a different amount of time. And I like you're 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 totally preaching to the choir here because I I don't think there's anything more important than than branding. And we also like pride ourselves on being uh, a lifestyle brand. And a lot of people throw that word around today, and they just say, oh, you know, it's a lifestyle brand, and they they make a logo or whatever, and that's what they do. But like, you actually have to live that lifestyle, and the transparency and the authenticity, I think, is is really what resonates with everybody. And what I found is like building it this way, it's the only way I could have ever imagined building something up. And it takes a lot longer than doing some of the more, you know, industry intensive or clickbaity kind of things. So it's taken longer to grow. But as you said, the ceiling with something that's authentic is so much higher than all these other places. Like we do have content like this, right? And I don't think you find this at most other you know, YouTube channels or fantasy brands. We do, you know, I put out vlogs kind of documenting what's going on behind my business. We put out, you know, like stock videos. We put out NBA Top Shot videos. Now, like we're all over the place. We really try to live the lifestyle that things we're passionate about. We put content on content out based around that stuff. And I think that's what resonates and, and gives the ceiling. And I think over the next five years, the companies that will win are the only ones that really focus on brand. Like I try to make sure that for every piece of content we do, that is like, fantasy related we're not a fantasy football brand we're a lifestyle brand that has grown a lot through fantasy football so i look at it very similar to the way you look at it five years from now i might not even be talking about fantasy football because that's not what i'm passionate about but that's what will grow and hopefully through the authenticity of of the way i deliver the way i communicate resonates with people so that they do listen to me on other topics and other passions of mine i think that is that's what makes like media today so so fun because a lot of companies are still not doing that so there's this this ripe opportunity for companies and brands to separate themselves by just just being who you are well i mean let's let's face it right if you're a fantasy content provider and all you're doing is making picks i'm a user i'm listening to you if the picks you make that i follow aren't right eventually i'm going to yep. get pissed and i'm going to walk away so you want, you want to be fun, right? And, and the best example, and I know you had Andy on what I think your first show, mm-hmm. like the footballers and I mean, they were incredible partners in monkey knife fight last year, you know, Andy, Mike, and Jason are, I mean, they're the best. They're the premier right? brand I mean, in our space for sure. They are. And, and I, I mean, I was listening to the footballers you know, before I became partners of, of them. And I mean, they are exactly who they seem on air. I mean, they're, they're literally three of the nicest, funniest guys you'll ever meet. Yep. But what separated them is, yeah, they might not make the right picks, but they make you laugh. They have fun. They make fun of each other. Like it's an enjoyable experience. Do I, do I follow everything that Mike or, or, or Jason or Andy has to say on a week to week basis? No, but do I enjoy hearing them describe what they think to each other and to me damn right i do because they're fun right 
their entertaining content at the end of the day is the key. Being authentic and genuine with your audience is essential because ultimately, guess what? If you're relying on making picks and being the best, you know, expert picker there is, eventually you're going to hit a cold streak. And when you do, that fan that just lost a hundred or fifty dollars is going to be like, "Damn, I don't want to listen to that person anymore." And then they're going to go off and they're going to find another podcast because guess what? There are hundreds of co- podcasts now about fantasy sports. Mm-hmm. Hundreds of of pieces of content online. There's thousands of people on Twitter you can follow. Everyone's a fantasy football expert. You know, ultimately, what is going to separate you? Everyone has their hot take. Everyone has this. Everyone has that. No, it's it's who you are, right? Yeah. And if you can't create a bridge to that audience, well, you know what? Just trade stocks or just play daily fantasy sports because you're not going to build a daily fantasy sports business. You're not going to be a content provider. You could be a great player, but you're not going to be a successful content creator unless you can create something authentic. And the fact that you talk about all these different things is essential because ultimately, like, I'm learning about Top Shot. Who am I learning about Top Shot from? <laughs> you know who I'm learning it from? Freaking Jeremy Levine, right? <laughs> you know, yep. he's the one, like, two weeks ago on a call, he's like, man, because I'm an old guy. I'm like, I don't get this top shot thing. And he had just spent whatever, like $35,000 on a, you know, on a Morant. Melman, yeah. I'm like, explain this to me. He explained it to me. And I was like, okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Cause it was coming from someone who I trusted and is genuine. He's not necessarily a content provider, but he's Jerry. I mean, he's a personality in this industry, right? Yeah, for sure. And, and I'm curious, like from, you know, w- when you're partnering with like a bigger team, obviously a lot more, decision power goes into that like you have to be more selective and there's a whole process behind it like for instance the way we linked up which i i still think to this day is like hilarious zach reached out to me via instagram he found us via instagram which is like a platform that we're on and we like fuck around with but it's not something that we're like super focused on like providing value outside of like entertainment it's one of our smaller platforms that we're on like way more followers on twitter i I, our youtube is obviously our biggest platform with like almost fifty thousand subscribers he found us via instagram so like when you're finding different content creators individuals or brands or companies within the space it seems more of like uh not necessarily like throw it up on the wall and see what sticks but there's probably a lot larger room for error so maybe can you take us through the process of like how you select what content creators to become affiliates with and then like in terms of um payment we don't have to get into the numbers but like what do you base a number on when working with content creators is it you know just simply taking the lifetime value of a customer and you know minimizing that and saying it works for both sides or you know just kind of take us through that process with with individuals Hey, uh, we'll we'll pay as little as we can convince them to take. Facts. How about I, that, I figured. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> if we're being honest no, here, yeah. No, I mean, I mean, in 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 reality, I mean, any good business, right? You get the lowest price you can. Sure. No, I I mean, I think that typically, you know, from a from a payments perspective, there's kind of an industry standard of what a depositing user is worth. The slant that we like to think of it is is we want to reward. We want to reward partners not only for bringing us a real depositing user, but also trying to figure out ways to incentivize those partners to keep those users engaged, right. to keep them playing. Right. I have, I have a lot a of people real, in this real quick before you say that, like, it, what yeah. is, do you have the numbers of like what the industry standard is for like a lifetime value of customer in the? I don't know how it's broken up. Daily fantasy versus season long or something like that. You know, I mean, the number that goes around a lot around DFS is between 400 and 425 bucks. But I mean, like, like as an example, Monkey Knife Fight's only a couple of years old. So, you know, what's our LTV? We don't have enough, the, the data, the sample size is not big enough. What, right? what would be a big enough sample size? What, five years, three years? Yeah, five years. Yeah, we typically, you know, probably after three years, you can get a really good cohort analysis done Mm -hmm. but you know but also with the pandemic right this is gonna this this is gonna affect the analysis the cohort analysis of 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 lifetime values because you know the what the pandemic has done or what the pandemic did is it was it companies almost have to look at reacquiring customers right because they dropped off for so long but you know when it comes to finding good partners I mean, you mentioned Zach, like we have an incredible, like Zach quarterbacks, our affiliate, kind of our affiliate partnership team works closely, like from a sales perspective. And then we have a great guy named Andy who manages our relationships. You know, Zach spends a lot, I mean, Zach's job is to find us great partners. I trust Zach's opinion, straight up. If Zach says, this is a great company, um, we should do a deal with them. 
I don't have the time to do the research into every single partner that we eventually work with. Mm-hmm. Some of the bigger partnerships, absolutely, but I trust Zach. Zach is Zach is an incredible team member, understands the industry as well as anyone I've met, has a great rapport with partners, yeah. and does a great job at finding really great partners, right? And I I trust you can make the reference that I'm a quarterback. I need to trust that my right tackle is going to block my, or my lack, I'm a righty. So I'm going to trust my left tackle is going to block the blind side. So I I can wait for the receiver doing the, you know, the 10 yard out for the pattern to actually develop, right? It's going to take a little bit longer. So I need to trust that Zach is going to block for three and a half seconds, Mm -hmm. right? I trust Zach. Yeah. (laughs) So, and and it's, it's, it's funny because like, we had worked together this previous season, obviously, but to a to a much lesser extent the season prior to that because we got linked up like a few weeks into the actual NFL season, so we already had so much going on, and we wanted to make sure that we had some kind of partnership to an, an elongated piece of it for this last season in 2020. And uh, for me, like obviously committing myself to one company as like the premier DFS platform that I'm going to be putting my audience onto for the entirety of the years is a big undertaking for me. Cause that means I can't put, you know, my energy elsewhere. I can't make other partnerships. So like there's a huge sense of needing to feel connected with you guys. So like sitting down with you guys in Vegas was obviously like the thing that made this work for me. Cause that was the first time, like I had talked to Zach and I can get a feel for him just like over text message or through Instagram DMS that he's like a real dude. And he like relates to me on just like a personal level. So I was like, I, I, you know, I appreciate that. And then I sit down with you guys. I'm like, yo, these are like very genuine guys. These are cool guys. These are guys that like, I know if things get weird or in a sticky situation, business wise, we'll be, ha- we'll be able to have like an open conversation. Like they're open to this being a two way relationship rather than it just being all about the money. So yeah, like Zach does a fantastic job with it. Like he, he texts me all the time, just like randomly, like personally throughout the week, if I ever have a problem with, you know, getting, getting paid from you guys or just something I saw in the system, I'm like, oh, this is a hiccup. Like I text him and be like, I'll, I'll get back to you in like two seconds. Let me just talk to the accounting people or whatnot. So I think that's another really, really important piece of it is like, right. You're seeing Zach has what it takes to, to do this job. And, uh, and I agree with you there because the, the person, the personal, uh, connection between like a creator, like myself and the rep from a company is really important. Like that could be the make or break selection between me partnering with you guys versus me partnering with a, a DraftKings if I feel like I'm just like another you know number into the cog. Well, I mean, ultimately, as we were growing and even still, I mean, we were a startup, right? Mm-hmm. And ultimately, when you're when you're when you're a startup, things happen. So, as an example, like because there's you know we have a finite number of people. If the person in charge of our payables happens to get sick or happens to you know, God forbid, have a family emergency and they happen to be, you know, out of the office or out of the office, away from their computer, dealing with things that, let's face it, are more fucking important right. than monkey knife fight. And and partners unfortunately don't get paid on time like they're usually paid. If we don't have a relationship, a real relationship with those partners to explain that, to have partners understand the reality, then the relationship fails, mm-hmm. right? So, you know, what I was saying was like the thing about the thing about Monkey and I fight and the thing that you you saw is like we're we're just real genuine people. I mean, the reality is the fantasy industry, unfortunately, around, you know, between, you know, 2014 to 2016, 2017, there was a lot of there were a lot of really shitty people and really shitty companies in the fantasy industry that took advantage of a lot of people. Yeah, straight up. Right. And that you can't wash that dirt off just with water and soap. There's a lot of people that were really that were really hurt by what occurred. And we don't have to get into the details of a lot of those companies and, and what what happened. So I think that it was essential, one, for us to be honest and, and genuine with all of our partners to create those relationships. But ultimately, and this is gonna sound a little self-serving, but like this is just who I am. This is who I've always been. I I, I don't I, bullshit to me is a waste of time. I've always worn my emotions on my sleeve. I've always been a straight up straight up person. And quite frankly, I want to work with people who are similar to me in that way because that's the way I am. And quite frankly, there's a lot of people that I've worked with who haven't been as open or as honest as I am. And eventually 
that becomes obvious and the relationships just have to change. So it's like that with our partners too. And ultimately, you know, I think that it's important for our partners to know, and there's been moments when, you know, people, whether it's, you know, big affiliates or small partners who reach out to me personally and say, Hey man, like, can, can you just tell me what's going on? Can you help me with this? And I'll find out what's going on. I'll tell them the, the reality and I'll try and work to solve that problem. You know, unfortunately, and the reality is with startups, sometimes it is payable related, right? It's what it boils down to. A lot of the times it is money based. And ultimately, as much as you're a funded startup, certain times cash flows do get tight, right? right. Um, and you need to, you know, you, people just need to be cognizant of each other. And ultimately, I think that, yeah, I mean, I, there's so much wasted time and energy, you know, built into creating facades that aren't real, mm -hmm. um, that I like just to dispel all that horseshit and just get right down to it, right? Yeah, I mean, um, like, when we, when me and Zach were initially talking about our contract, like, you know, we sat down in Vegas, and then over the next couple of weeks or months or whatever, we had talked numbers back and forth, and then the quarantine hit, and then, you know, Zach was, like, completely honest. He's like, listen, like, quarantine hits, like, xyz with money we're gonna have to figure something out that works for both sides and i was you know it, it's just something that you're honest about and at the time i was like listen i'm like I'm, I'm pretty liquid right now there's nothing that i need promise from you guys up front so if we need to figure out where you know for the next three four months we could back up the pay until you guys get whatever's going on you know what i mean like that 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 is so much appreciated especially from like a small content creator side and that's something that will make me loyal to a brand like you guys, even if I can get a better offer elsewhere, like I already have that connection with you guys. I already have the relationship. I already know that when push comes to shove, like I'm going to have your back, you're going to have my back, vice versa. So those things are like wildly, wildly important when building the foundation of a company or building the foundation as an individual content creator. Yeah. I mean, bingo, right? Yeah. I mean, again, and I, and I think I probably use this word more than any other word on this, this show is, is authentic and genuine. Just Fucking beach anyway, man. Always. Like, ah, just bullshit sucks. <laughs> <laughs> that it does. All right, let's try to wrap this up a little bit because we are, we are getting towards the two hour mark and, you know, I love the conversation so I could probably sit here for like four hours, but obviously want to respect your time. I know you got a lot going on. I do have, I guess, a, a personal question from my point of view where you see me at right now as like an individual content creator or just building a brand that's in the media space. Do you have any like tips that come to mind in terms of scaling? It could be a financing. It could be like a relationship. It could really be anything like someone that you see in, in, in my shoes. If you were in my shoes, like a piece of advice you would give to me. I mean, I'd, honestly, Nick, I think you're doing as well of a job as I think anyone in this space, knowing that you are, you know, you're, you're small, right? I mean, ultimately you're building this up effectively yourself, almost like from the, from the ground up. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess the only advice is, and you, you already hit on it, like you're not just doing fantasy content, right? You're doing content that you think the fan of fantasy sports is also interested in, right? Creating a lifestyle around sports gaming is, I think, the best way to go. You are a fantasy expert that also happens to be interested in other things. I mean, at the end of the day, you're not just talking about Top Shot because that's what people are talking about today. You've, you're you interested in it, right? Mm -hmm. And that comes across. I think that the other thing is look at new, you know, like look at new technologies, look at the new things that, that are emerging, right? Like in Clubhouse is an example, right? I mean, Clubhouse is something everyone's talking about right now as, a, you know, not necessarily seeing the Clubhouse is gonna be the winner, but drop in audio, right? How are you going to, because drop in audio, there's Clubhouse, there's, you know, Facebook, there's Twitter spaces, you know, Mark Cuban, I think is doing his own called Fireside. I think that's what it's called. There's Locker Room. Like there's a bunch of companies that are trying to figure out this drop in audio thing. So drop in audio is going to be something. How do, how does big dogs insert themselves into the drop in audio world and be again, authentic and genuine around right. it? Like, like Clubhouse, no one's figured out the paywall system. Well, what is, what's a way to do it, right? I know that they're thinking about doing something like, like tipping and Twitch and shit. It's looking at emerging trends. And I'm not necessarily saying jump into everything that you see, but there's, you know, there's writing on the wall, right? So to me, the writing on the wall is drop in audio is going to be something, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know what it's going to be yet, but it's going to be something. There's going to be revenue to be made around it. Could that be a cool anchor point for a content opportunity there. 
Yeah, that's probably. Good. That's good advice. I like Clubhouse a lot, actually. I'm pretty integrated into, I guess, the fantasy space right now. They got a couple of the clubs that are kind of taking over as the you know premier clubs in the space, and I think I'm an admin of one of them actually. So a lot of the times I'm on the stage talking about it. And what, what I oh, like add is, me to it because I I like it a lot. I've gotten. Into I actually it a lot I days. actually think you're in the one because I was talking to one of my friends that is also. Are you familiar with Sal Salvitri? Oh, I love Sal. I was talking to Sal the other day. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. I think I had talked to him right after you did, and he was like, "Oh, Nick was in the clubhouse room with oh. me, and like it's like the <laughs> fantasy sports clubhouse or whatever, right?" Oh, okay. So I am there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Totally. So that one, I, I jump in there like all the time, and I kind of like talk on stage, and that's been fun for me because it's not necessarily the same fantasy stuff. Like I wouldn't start a room that's like you know top ten, at least not at this point. The organic growth is not worth my time for fantasy specific content, but the fact that JL had started the room based around networking within fantasy lets me get on stage and and talk about stuff like this exact conversation in there and kind of like, for lack of a better term, like make yourself a kind of a thought leader in the space when it comes to business in fantasy sports. And I'm like, that's something I'm really, really passionate about. So that's the way I'm thinking about it. Monetization is going to be really interesting to see how they do that, whether it's like premier groups that you have to pay to get into or become a membership guy for someone on a club. You know, it, it, it will be really interesting, but you're right. Like Twitter spaces, I'm trying to get access to that right now to kind of test it out because that would be cool because I already have like a built-in audience there but definitely yeah definitely kind of keeping your ear down to the grindstone and seeing what's emerging because where there's smoke there's fire there's going to be something that you know emerges out of there for sure yeah and i think just keep doing what you're doing i mean ultimately you don't need to be you don't need to be the number one expert of x if you are a excuse me entertaining commentator of the alphabet if you know what i mean right i mean you're building a, a sports gaming lifestyle content brand Right. You mm-hmm. don't need big dogs to be on a, a you know, behind home plate of, of Miller Park like that wouldn't necessarily make sense for you. But, you know, as you grow, will people come to you because you have an audience that's interested in all of these things? Then, yeah. Right. You know, you become the word influencer is so over. I hate it. Days. I hate it so much. But like I, I do. I do, too. Right. Just because you have a million Twitter followers doesn't make you an influencer. That's to me that that's the biggest fallacy, right? You have you know you have a you have five hundred thousand Instagram follows. Doesn't mean doesn't mean you're an influencer. What amazes me is a lot of times when these people have you know four hundred thousand Twitter followers, and you look at their tweets, and there's like three or four likes or five mm-hmm. or six are like you're not influencing shit. Yeah, right? yeah. Like the world uh, gets put on right? a pedestal, but like when you take a step back, it's like, okay, are you actually mentally influencing people? Those are influencers, Correct. the ones who actually make people think differently. They'll follow your path. You're willing to kind of go out on a limb, be authentic, show your vulnerabilities. Those are the people who influence other people. And that's the way I look at it too. Like I hate, I hate, I hate the word influencer. I even like feel weird calling myself like a YouTuber, even though like I kind of officially am just those words, like get such a stigma that, you know, sometimes you need to step back and kind of piece. It's like a sum of its parts almost. It gets, it gets a little weird. Okay. I agree. It's been, it's been long. It's been fucking fantastic. I've actually learned a lot from this conversation. So I love getting on, uh, you know, calls like this where someone who's far ahead of me in the business world can kind of drop some knowledge on myself and uh, the people out there. I hope you guys enjoyed the conversation. If you did, of course, make sure you hit the thumbs up button. Make sure you're following Nick on Twitter. His at is linked down below. Make sure you go hop on Monkey Knife Fight and play some games on there. They have all the sports up right now. Obviously, football is not going, but basketball is in full steam. So they got plenty of games uh, that are March wildly- Madness, man. March Madness. We're going to have March Madness for the first time. And I'm so excited. How are you going to do because that? Because let's face Well, what do you mean? March well, like, Madness. Are you just like straight betting? But you, I mean, you can't do college players. Oh, DFS. DFS. Well, well, in certain states, amateur players are allowed. Oh, yeah. Totally. Oh, There's certain okay. states where you can't play DFS with NCAA athletes, but there are a number of Zara. There's, there's a whack of states where you can. And I'm so excited about MKF and March Madness because I'm not a I, I like college basketball, but I'm not a diehard. So I don't know who the, the third player on Virginia is. But in Monkey Knife Fight, right? It's like, you know, two out of two or three out of three players. Right. Like you can go into a March Madness game in round two and just pick, you know, players in that game. Like, so I'm really excited about March Madness on our platform personally. All right, that's that's awesome. So everybody make sure you tune in to March Madness. We finally get it. We didn't get it last year, but now that we got it back, we got it back better than ever because of Monkey Knife Fight. Nick, thank you for joining me today, man. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Nick. And we'll see y'all on the next episode of Behind the Business of Fantasy.